Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our definitely seasonal holiday celebration, our Christmas edition of Bull Sessions. My name is Mark Robertson. I am joined here by Ken Kabula. Good afternoon, Ken. Good afternoon. Merry Christmas, everybody. I'm feeling particularly festive today, so let's uh, ring the bells and uh, drink a little bit of eggnog and sing some carols and get moving here. So you've got everything purchased. Do you have everything wrapped also? It's all purchased. It's all wrapped. It's oh. all ready to go. We're just waiting now for the traditional Christmas Eve uh, dinner and then Christmas Day itself. So yeah. I'm envious. And how I about even you? I even have the pierogies purchased, uh, Mark. <laughs> so. And we're also joined here by Kim Butcher. She's able to get with us today. She's uh, uh, I believe that there's banana bread in the oven. And well, what else you got cooking down there in Florida, Kim? Uh, I made my rosemary cashews. Ooh. And the banana bread just came out of the oven. Very nice. Very nice. Well, welcome, Kim. We're glad you're able to join us for today and and uh, have a great holiday season down there with mom. All right. So we'll, we're going to cover, like Ken already mentioned, the eggnog, Oracle, all kinds of different stuff, a little bit on Christmas countdowns, but just kind of a, a footloose edition of kicking around some stuff here this afternoon as we close out this year. Here's a reminder. A lot of very familiar names. Welcome back. Some new names. Good to see you here. Welcome. We keep, tend to keep this fairly informal so you can communicate via the text box in the questions box. If you have audio equipment, you can actually raise your hand and uh, communicate with us across the audio waves also. Um, no investment recommendation is intended by anything that we talk about. We are definitely going to be talking about real companies in real time. The purpose of these sessions, and we've been doing them for a couple of years now, is just kind of to kick around current themes and topics and do them from the perspective of demonstrating the philosophies, methods, and techniques of the modern investment club movement. So everything is illustration or demonstration slash education and uh, sharing of ideas. Please do not consider anything that we uh, talk about to be a recommendation for sale. Please do your own homework. You will hear opinions from Ken, Kim, and me and uh, anybody else who holds up their hand along the way. Please do your own homework. Um, we will try to remember to disclose when we hold um, positions in the companies that we talk about here. And uh, we do a monthly program called the Roundtable. It's uh, generally on the last Tuesday of every month at 8.30 Eastern time. Been doing that now for 12 years. And uh, the next session of the Roundtable is actually gonna slip one week into the first week of January. But, and if you'd like to be reminded about that session and future sessions, please send an email to nkabula1 at comcast.net. Again, that's a monthly webcast, uh, generally the last Tuesday of the month. If you have any uh, suggestions for future topics, or if you'd like uh, copies of slides, or if you have follow-up questions or just thoughts to share, our two email addresses are down there at the bottom of the page, markr at manifestinvesting.com and kcabula1 at comcast.net. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we have, uh, I think I shared a couple with you, Ken, a couple very nice uh, le new, uh, letters, emails, and correspondence here within the last couple of weeks. And uh, that, uh, that helps me get out of bed in the morning. I don't know about you, Ken. It's nice to get validation sometimes, Mark, and uh, our community is really good at doing that a, a lot of different ways and a lot of different times. Uh, I appreciate our audience. Uh, I don't think that this would be nearly as much fun with with an audience that wasn't uh, doing the work right along with us and, and checking us and, and making us think on a regular basis. So uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year to our audience, and uh, we love you a whole lot. And, as long as you keep coming to our events, we'll keep doing them. Absolutely. Well, here's a look at our, we call it the bullpen, stuff that we intend to talk about going forward. Some of those features in the very middle of the page are kind of standing features for right now. And uh, we'll see how that goes uh, going forward. We will cover some of those topics down at the bottom. I confess I still haven't read my inflation homework yet. So, Ken, uh, what, am, are you going to send me to the principal's office or detention or uh 
you know, the admonish me for the not more doing I, it. The more I read about inflation, Mark, the more I've come to the conclusion that you handle inflation with good common sense and uh, there, there aren't any hard and fast rules and there certainly are not a lot of generalities you can draw about investing in general uh, when inflation uh, rears its ugly head. Uh, it's it's different for different industries. It's different for different sectors, and it's certainly different for different companies. And uh, management is so key when it comes to dealing with inflation. Uh, the strategies that they choose to employ to handle uh, the rise in in costs, uh, depending on what's causing those, those strategies really will make a difference for the company and. Uh, I, I just don't think there's there's a lot you can draw and say, here's a hard and fast rule to use when inflation hits. The only one that I can think of, and maybe you could think of a couple more, but the only one that I can really think of is that uh, when inflation really begins to rear its head, PEs will contract. That's about all I can come up with on a, on a, a macro kind of rule setting. Yeah, and, and when it comes to macro, the thing I keep running into, which is probably what's slowing me down on doing my reading, is uh, this voice of Nicholson just basically saying, you're already doing all the stuff you need to do. That being, understand that you're, the business models of the companies that you follow. You just said it. Uh, trust management to hopefully do the right things in response to the challenges. But as long as you're um, applying the same methodology, and then he goes on to go into a little bit deeper um, um, explanation of what you just said. Yeah, PEs contract, but don't forget that the top line actually expands. So it's kind of like yep. a, it's a balancing effect. And so yep. at the end of the day, how do you deal with inflation? You find excellent companies and you buy them when they're on sale. And, it, and that sounds like what you do when there's not inflation too, doesn't it, Mark? <laughs> so, and I mean, it just keeps coming back to just keep doing what you're doing. And right. so, you know, that, that's that explains why my homework's not done yet. Yeah, well, I've told you a hundred times, Mark, how I always stress us uh, 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 aware of the patience and discipline, uh, those two words that Nicholson uses an awful lot when he writes. Uh, he likes those two words, but when you read some of the things that he writes about inflation, or, yeah, about inflation, you also get the word prudence in there an awful lot. So uh, maybe we want to, to define that word and talk a little bit about the prudent investor. Uh, just talk about that a little bit at one of the sessions coming up. He has written a couple of articles about the prudent investor. I will make a note of that and we can do that. So anyhow, these are top topics that are in the mill to be covered uh, as soon as we can. All right, a little bit of news. Um, we spent uh, the beginning of a year ago talking about Tesla and trying to understand early stage investing and this guy. And sure enough, he's uh, on the cover of Time Magazine. I was kind of hoping that Ken or Ken and I, you know, it could be Ken pictured on the cover and then Mark Robertson not pictured would be <laughs> probably come down. But uh, that still stings, doesn't it, Mark? <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, T Tesla is quite a story, and I just love the Dogecoin dog uh, driving the Tesla truck there on the right. Um, good, clean fun. And and Kim, you weren't on the cover either, so we got to keep working. We lose Kim. She may have to step away. We're always mindful of that. No, no, no. I, I'm here. I was had, was muted, and all I said was, uh, "I don't ever want to be on the cover. I don't want people to necessarily know about me through the whole world." <laughs> it, it's quite a quite a heavy uh, burden to shoulder, and of course, he's doing some really crazy things with tweets now. All right, and other news that when we'll... doesn't he? go ahead. I said, "When doesn't he?" Well, yeah, he's been uh, he's been interesting for a long time to put a sugar coating on it for sure and he's, he is gifted there's no doubt he's uh i mean the first time i saw them land that rocket on a barge uh in the middle of the ocean was just unbelievable anyhow speaking of uh some pretty talented people here you go this this is a uh a, a deal that we're probably going to have to take a closer look at 
and uh, decide what we think about it. A lot of uh, shareholders in both of these companies in our audience. Uh, Oracle is in our Manifest 40. Cerner is just about in the Manifest 40. And I know some very experienced, successful investors that own a pretty good stake in Cerner. So uh, I, I, I think this is an interesting phenomenon that we might want to dig into a little bit deeper. Uh, interested in the thoughts from both of you on Oracle and Microsoft appearing to really go after this this uh, space of healthcare and information. What are your thoughts? Well, Mark, I have 17 stocks in my IRA. Uh, one of them is Neogen, which we were talking about pre-session, uh, and, and it's going to to take on a really large chunk of 3M. And another of my 17 stocks is Cerner, and it's going to be swallowed up by one of Natalie's 18 stocks in her IRA, uh, which is Oracle. So we're, we're going to spend a lot of time in the next two or three weeks trying to understand, uh, you know, is there any opportunity to be made in selling soon or not selling soon? And, and what do we do? Are we going to hold for the long term after the companies are created? Uh, uh, are there going to be... Uh, piles of of things to step around uh, as you move forward with the deals uh, a lot of questions have to be answered all we've gotten so far are some uh, pretty sketchy news releases which are all happy talk at the moment you know i think either not next week because uh, we're, we're both going to be traveling next week but a couple weeks out we might take a look at the nature of this deal for cerner and just demonstrate that uh we're probably looking at a par close to zero for that $95 in cash because that's the type of premium that's fairly common in a situation like this. So we'll, we'll take a look at that and dissect it. But Kim, from uh, 35,000 feet, what are your thoughts on healthcare and these information companies? Everything I think is, everything is going to data, data, data and uh, who can provide the service, the service of taking care of the data. And I think we are going to see a lot more consolidation. All right. So uh, I, I, I'm going to agree with Kim to a point, uh, but I think before the, uh, a fantastic amount of consolidation has to be done, uh, I think we have to get to the point where we've actually convinced uh, the the people in healthcare, uh, primarily the uh, hospital administrators, the doctors that run their own practices, the doctors that sit on boards of smaller practices and larger practices, that we're going to have to convince them that this is in their best interest uh, to begin to bring this data together and make it something that people can use uh, on a uh, on the spur of the moment or, or use in many different ways. Uh, I think healthcare, uh, uh, an awful lot of practitioners are still mired in, in big, fat, thick paper files that they pull out of drawers and slap onto desks when they need to. I agree with you, Ken, and it's a great, uh, right now it's a huge transition because there are lots of physicians' offices who Number one, don't want to change. Number two, if they consolidate the physician's practice instead of an individual practice to being a nothing but an orthopedic practice, and you know, instead of one practice, you got 10 doctors, but then you get bought out by a consortium of anesthesiologists that are across the country, anesthesiologist group. And the big thing I think with all of this is physicians are used to being their independent practice and they're getting less money because as you have more consolidation, whoever's doing the consolidating, the big company is taking more of the profits and physicians are not getting near as much profit as they had before. And they're having a lot of uh, stomach issues to swallow that. And then when they accept to go into a big practice, how many patients they see, how often they have to see them, their time restraints with the physician, all that changes as well. It, there, it's a completely change in the dynamic of healthcare. 
Well, you're both actually giving me chills because, I mean, I'm sitting here with this image of Vladimir Putin and Ken throwing around a red card and a yellow card and my selection of e-health for the best small companies this year. And, uh, yeah, it's a it's a brutal challenge in playing field. And then, then you toss on top of that, what in the world is Agilon doing with that uh, practice that they're building? You know, there, there's some interesting questions here, and we, we need to dig in a little bit deeper. Good stuff. All right. Speaking of eHealth, here's our best small company update for the day. These prices are as of this morning. Um, our traditional portfolio, which is the buy and hold for one year from Halloween to Halloween, is running at about 1940 so it's down $60 from the original 2000 um, Our one trade out of eHealth and trade into Pachira, uh, has actually worked out pretty well so far, a few dollars. Keep in, keep in mind that the scale is pretty uh, tight on that uh, bar chart up at the top. These are all basically laying on top of each other right now, but we're only a little over a month into this. And the market has actually beaten our best small companies so far. But as we have shared in a number of articles, uh, we're in a bit of a bear market right now with some of these smaller companies. So I, I smell opportunity continue to smell opportunity here your thoughts anytime the market has volatility all i say is woohoo let's go find some bargains i don't uh see any uh hitting our 20 percent like they did uh last week mark uh you know 20 percent relative return negative uh so far not there but uh, i would would I think we need to to get up up on our toes and be looking for a couple three uh, replacements uh, in case iRobot and Superior Group uh, and maybe even uh, Sharps Compliance uh, continue to to do the kinds of things they're uh, they're doing. Sharps is not anywhere uh, as close as uh, Superior Group and iRobot are, uh, but uh, maybe now is the time to to look for. Uh, three or four or even five replacements uh, and uh, start, uh, I'll do my bit and I'll try to identify three uh, by the time two weeks uh, goes by, okay? Okay, yeah, I think we always want to have, uh, talk about another bullpen. Uh, well, maybe, we right. should, maybe we should call it the rabbit pen. But uh, okay. let's, the rabbit hutch. In, the, in honor of the festive holiday season, let's talk about the other end of the chart. Um, Absolutely, because well, there are some there's some great stocks up on top there. Yeah, Ken, this is one of your uh, discoveries from uh, Halloween this year. I want to give us a quick background of Fulgent, and I've got a series of slides which talks about where it's been and where it seems to be going. Well, Fulgent is, is I think, on the cutting edge of, of new medicine. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with medical records uh, like we were just talking about, but it's on the, the cutting edge of identifying uh, parts of the human genome that are peculiar to different individuals. And once you could begin to identify those very specific uh, parts, you can begin to do all kinds of things, uh, tailor making medicines and, and therapies and uh, infusions uh, for the specific problem that the human being might uh, have, plus or minus. Uh, you can see uh, in the different areas where Fulgence tests right now are, are helping people determine, not determine that they have cancer, for example, but determining specifically what kind of cancer and what genes are they, is that cancer tied to. Uh, that opens up the door to uh, all kinds of new technologies. Uh, if you don't know what CRISPR is, it opens up the door to CRISPR technology, for example, CRSPR technology. And uh, I, I just like the company. Uh, I think this is the kind of company that's actually uh, selling things and beginning to make money uh, that might be uh, snapped up uh, by uh, a large pharmaceutical company, for example, Mark, mm -hmm. uh, that, has, that has, you know, reserves and is looking to, to uh, help uh, in their quest for new drugs, for new therapies, for new whatever it is they're looking for. So uh, I, I like the idea of Fulgent, and 
I think it's a poster child for uh, the kind of company that we've been calling uh, early stage investing. It's just been profitable now for three quarters, uh, maybe four quarters that that 2020 uh, year might represent two or even three positive quarters, but it hasn't been profitable for very long. Yeah, and, and it's 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 a a very promising company that's um, innovating and you know incubating along, and they're they're actually one of the beneficiaries of COVID nineteen. Uh, they very rapidly uh, responded to an opportunity to develop the tests. I think the test kits are probably going to continue to expand, and I don't think they're going away overnight. And uh, uh, the the cash flow from that. Uh, opportunity is really bolstering the rest of this business. So here's a couple of things that I wanted to point out to the audience. Um, fairly recent article from The Motley Fool, three stocks that could make you richer in December and beyond. Um, Fulgent was one of three. The other two were covered in the article were AbV and Teladoc. Um, and Fulgent really kind of sticks out as, uh, you know, again, an early stage speculative opportunity, but that cash has, is really pretty massive. And you're right, Ken, probably makes them an acquisition target, too, because um, it, it's actually a fairly sizable sum. So you can see some of the metrics across there and some of the decent size opportunity. And Fulgent's been on a bit of a run, up with a relative strength index of about 70. Here's just a quick excerpt from that. I'm not going to read this other than to say that the COVID-19 thing, the testing came along and really bolstered this business. And they're working in some very promising areas that Ken's already delineated um, with respect to the gene stuff. But you can actually yeah, what, go ahead. What Ken. surprises me so much, Mark, is uh, when your your family is faced with uh, one of these uh, diseases that strikes fear. You know, just by the very mention of the name, the big C. You know, you talk about cancer, and uh, the last thing that I would have expected when uh, we heard about cancer in my family was that we would be looking at genetic testing to start the process. Uh, I expected, you know, we'd be talking about radiation and chemo and and uh, surgery, and, uh, and we did. We talked about all those things, but uh, the first thing, the very first thing we talked about was uh, getting on board with, with the kind of genetic testing that the uh, oncologist wanted to be able to to specifically uh, pin down the exact type of cancer we were dealing with, and therefore be able to put together uh, a, a series of treatments that were aimed exactly at what was wrong, instead of the the old fashioned you know shotgun approach was mm -hmm. we'll just we'll we'll throw a lot of buckshot out there and hope that some of the buckshot hits what what it needs to hit to, to cure. Uh, so it's, I, I just, I can't say too much about this company. It's, it's really good when an article like that comes out and I own two of the three stocks. I feel real nice about that. So, yeah, we own a small stake in Fulgent also, and I'm kind of excited yeah. about where it seems to be going. Here's a quick look at the price to fair value a la Morningstar. And again, we, we, uh, use a grain of salt anytime you're dealing with early stage and Morningstar, or even value line. But in this case, they're pointing out that they believe the fair value is significantly above that current 105. You can see this point back in, uh, I believe it was February, they actually hit almost $190 a share. And that was the, uh, the effect of that huge cash flow. All right. Well, and, and we, I'm convinced that COVID testing is not going away anytime soon. I mean, as long as we keep having these different variants coming out, I'm, I'm convinced that we're going to have testing uh, you know, as part of the the normal rite of passage for people doing various kinds of activities. So, and Fulgence just buried itself in the middle of all that COVID testing. So you mm -hmm. you can't you can't not like that as the the prime mover of revenue at the moment. Yeah, and the stuff that they're working on in the background. And I think Kathy Wood is right about this one, and so are you. That there's just some really promising stuff going on there. And I, I have actually experienced some of that personally, too, with family members and that sort of thing. All right, let's go ahead and move on. I got a kick out of this one. 
and I'll give you the backstory on it. And while you guys are thinking about which one of the two logos are the the right one, uh, seven year old grandson looked at the current NBC logo and said they're doing it wrong. So that's your hint. The colors have changed. The green and the purple. Yeah, so is it A or B? Is Which one's the correct one? And you can answer in the text box if you want to take a, sh a shot at the answer if you're brave enough. Is it A or B? I'm guessing A. A lot of people do. The actual world-famous logo is B. Huh? And when I asked our seven-year-old grandson, why are they doing it wrong? He said, well, the one is it's in the right order on A. Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. But the one that has been used for over 50 years is on the right. Huh. So it's kind of interesting to me what a seven-year-old will notice. And that's our grandson moment for this week. <laughs> and meanwhile, Ken is out shopping for his three-year-old granddaughter. All right. Thought we might spend a moment with this one. Talk about the Groundhog Challenge. We are six weeks out from Groundhog Challenge 16 and the next edition of this. And what I did is I took uh, this year's entries and just splashed them onto a scatter chart of, which basically is how many selections did they make? We allow to make a minimum of five, a maximum of 20. And then the Y axis is how well they're doing. And uh, what do you see when you look at this, Ken? <laughs> uh, since we're looking, we're talking about sample size and everything. Uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've been doing this same kind of scatter chart, Mark, for our own contest uh, for the last uh, 15, 16 years, uh, looking for patterns. And uh, I don't happen to see any, and I'm not sure that I see any patterns uh, here uh, either. Uh, uh, except that the, I see, I see one. In this particular, well, in this particular sample, if you choose lots of stocks, you're probably making money. Is that what you're looking at? That's diversification. Yeah, it's not theory. I mean, if you if you want to end up, you know, in that range, that's you, you basically pick more stocks, and you get into that sweet sixteen plus or minus four zone. And it, I mean, it's fairly there's an outlier here. I, I see that in our uh, contest as well. Uh, I see that the, the clubs that that uh, tend to make more choices, they're allowed to choose from, from 1 to 15, and the clubs that choose closer to 15 uh, usually tend to beat the benchmark. Uh, we, don't look, we don't compare it to zero, we compare it to the benchmark, but it's the same general idea. Uh, but we've never had a winner uh, or a second place in the contest that's chosen more than 10 stocks. Exactly. So uh, Exactly. And this is, know, this is unrehearsed. Yeah. This is exactly where I thought if you want to go. If you want to want to go for broke, uh, you got to you got to choose fewer stocks. Yeah. And then also face the reality that uh, some of them are going to rule a five. <laughs> by the way, by the way this, this is me right here. This is me. Well, <laughs> you look at you look at my history in the Groundhog contest, and I've always chosen fewer stocks, and uh, I'm I'm quite attuned to uh, that below zero part of the graph uh, on, on various years. Uh, I've moved. I've been at the top a number of times, but I'm also been below zero a number of times too. You just you just have more chance with only five or six stocks to have a, a dog really pull you down. And it only takes one when you're at that part of the graph. Yep. And, and, and Kim, we don't need to look at the specific dot, but do you remember how many stocks you picked? I well, I'm, I'm sure that mine is the, the dot of uh, minus 60%. <laughs> no, that's not you. Wow. Well, then, thank you for making my day and giving me a smile. You're, 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 you're probably somewhere in here, I'm guessing. I don't know. I don't remember how many you picked. I do know that one of these is Hugh McManus. 
<laughs> and that's with a couple major winners. And, and as Ken said, one bad one will really bring you down. You'd find a bunch of Ardellics down here. That's what you'd find. All right, here's the actual results year to date. Again, six weeks and counting. Uh, New York Nick is uh, clinging with white knuckles over Indianapolis's Ruth Wilfong. But again, a lot of very interesting clubs near the top. A lot of very familiar names. Merry Christmas to all of you. And uh, one of the more rougher years, we've talked about this before, Kathy Wood still lingers and loiters down around the bottom of the list. So it just goes to show that a red hot stock picker can have a tough year. It's a very powerful reminder to uh, never forget and never be surprised by. It happens. All right, and Ken, you're still in the top 10. Well, we should uh, uh, do a shout out for Lana also, who's moved up to number eight right now. Yeah, uh, that's uh, that's rarefied territory, Lynn, and I'm glad that I'm up there right along with you. It's 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 a nice place to be. Yep, some good stuff. So good luck to everybody in the last uh, six weeks. And I'm just going to predict one of those miracles on ice that you know Mark's name could appear at the bottom of this list magically by. I've got six weeks to work on it as the scorekeeper. Just kidding. I don't mean that. All right. Uh, uh, quickly, uh, just a reminder that, uh, again, one of our favorite sessions from this past year has been uh, Brian Feraldi's discussion of valuation and this uh, S-curve subject, which we've dove into a little bit. Just a quick reminder uh, that it really does revolve around this notion of what we love to uh, think of as projected return on value and how that compares to projected annual return. And uh, just like to make the point, the top uh, points are on the right, but go ahead, Ken. I, I also think, Mark, if you back up just one uh, stock, we give we give Brian a, a, an award for the addition to the lexicon of the words price to hope. Uh, yes. we've, <laughs> we've decided that that's a really good way to describe a lot of uh, really, really, really early stage investing. And uh, that's the first time I had ever seen that phrase. I don't know about you, but mm -hmm. I had not. I don't remember ever seeing it anywhere else. So uh, tip of the hat. You can do pretty well with price to hope, but you can also do just the opposite. <laughs> and I, I have done just the opposite a couple of times in, an, in a career in investing. So interesting stuff. So again, just a reminder that, that the reason that we're into this talking points on the right, and again, that original stock selection guide, here's our just a quick reminder and again, this one of my favorite slides, just to point out that this life cycle stuff is not fiction. It's not theory. It uh, it happens. So recognizing where a company is in its life cycle or whatever challenges it's facing competitively or otherwise, pure market challenges, uh, things to consider. We've used it to take a look at longer perspectives on companies like Microsoft, and this one's cool. Um, seeing a number of stages in the life cycle of Microsoft. Ken wants to split this into four pieces, four different uh, eras of growth, growth rate from, uh, again, it's not just theory. You're talking about that launch period, that faster or hyper growth period, and then maturity. And then with a company like Microsoft, uh, that point beyond uh, potential maturity uh, on the right-hand side where they they definitely are firing on all cylinders now over the last, I would call that seven or eight years for sure. I don't want to fool around with the basic graphic, but we could call it reinvention, Mark. And, and we see that happening in really high quality companies, especially in the tech area. Absolutely. So we've had some good fun with that. So um, we also looked at Apple over the long term, looking at three decades with Apple. But here's just a quick a summary of the last. Uh, seven or eight years, along with a couple years of forecast, showing that Apple has done very well. And we've begun publishing these reports on the forum. You can see that Apple in the last three months went from 140 to 175. Pretty nice move. Actually bumped up in the sales forecast a little bit. A um, little bit of a bump up in the, the 
long-term low price forecast, probably not enough yet, but uh, you can see that the, they've made some pretty decent progress. Uh, PE's the same, well, hold on. Growth rate's a little bit higher. Profitability is roughly the same, um, 25, 26%. And the PE ratio is also the same. So really the only change is maybe a little bit more growth, but the projected annual return remains still pretty robust. Both of these figures here for the projected annual return compare pretty favorably to the projected return on value. You can see that they actually shed a little bit of long-term debt here, but they have retained it in uh, current liabilities and they continue to have $63 billion in their wallet. Um, pretty good run. I mean, the, they're up, up around the, the price target and uh, you can see that Morningstar thinks that they are very richly valued. Uh, I don't share that perspective. I think they're still in pretty good shape. Just the other night around the dinner table, I was stunned and amazed at all of the men and women who had on Apple Watches. I mean, they're all holding them up and comparing the size and the features and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Uh, I don't even wear a watch. And uh, uh, I, I felt like, you know, Ken talking about the early days, what was it, iPads and all that other stuff almost 10 years ago at one of your one of our regional conferences good stuff well we also had serious questions about the apple watch when it first was was presented uh if you remember at that point uh fossil was a big player in the watch field uh, you don't hear too much about fossil anymore uh and uh, i think the the normal uh, uh watch has moved to a fashion piece now. It, I, I don't think it's really used for for time telling anymore. Uh, it's 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 a status symbol for a lot of people to wear a very very expensive watch. Uh, but the people that still look at watches are my age, uh, you know, and I'm older than dirt. So hey, what do you want? <laughs> but I, I think there's a little bit of generation skipping there too, because these were mostly millennials that were. Uh, and touting and toting their Apple watches. And they 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 love to use it for the fitness stuff too, you know. And all the telemetry and all that kind of stuff that Hugh talked about. In fact, that reminds me we, we need to go back and revisit some of the stuff that Hugh said was coming a few years ago with respect to uh all kinds of cardiac cardiac data and other stuff that's going to be coming out of these devices as soon as they're allowed to. We need to get a picture of Hugh uh, with his uh, legs crossed sitting on top of a mountain somewhere pretty soon, Mark, you know? Well, we'll be working on that. We'll be working All on right. that. All right. All right. In terms of gifts at this time of year and things found under the tree, I have one. Uh, these, this happens to be the top performing selection so far. It's only five weeks old, and I know you're going to jump on me and say, Mark, it's early. Calm down. But uh, uh, all of our selections uh, have actually been doing fairly well, but I want you to notice the number one performer so far since November 11th. <laughs> Cyber applause. Is the audience, audience giving me any uh, an ovation? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing I will point out was a very active conversation between Len and Matt back and if either one of them wants to jump in here talking about how this thing just got incredibly crushed when it came to the stock price back i want to say about four maybe five months ago maybe not quite that long um but the stock price got down into the low 30s and they actually entertained quite a conversation about uh the facts and the realities of this company which was sensationalized in the press oh, excuse me. So, uh, you know, I, I picked it for the third time. The other two selections aren't doing quite that well from our conferences. And that's really sugarcoating. But notice that Ken and Kim are on the list there, too. And uh, Anne's Jack Henry. And, and my visa has actually uh, recovered a little bit from some of that the challenges that they faced the day after I made the selection. Well, and... My LGI Homes that I presented at Bank for the very first time, that's 
Ken has, has presented it, and then I was the one I think who found it. So yeah, <laughs> great. We're all doing well. <laughs> so we're we're piling up on you, Ken. <laughs> Double teaming. Well, nobody could say that I haven't been consistent about picking home builders the last uh, eight or ten months. So good. Got to got to got to pull in there what I think is going to make some money. So you bet. All right, let's talk a little bit about selections. I wish I was a little bit further along, but I have had a bit of a distraction here in the last few days. Um, Mark, I am gonna gonna unmute Matt Spielman because you asked for Matt to weigh in. Matt, go ahead. Good. Hey, yeah, you did ask. Hey, guys, Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas to you, Matt. Yeah. So I I did buy uh, Emergent Biosystems too after after this pick, but the the two things that stood out for me. Um, is the whole story that caused the fall was was one facility right that that mixed up the COVID uh, vaccines they were producing, but but when it when it when you get to the story now as they look to recertify that facility you understand that that was a lab, right it was a laboratory which was mm -hmm. pressed to scale up into into production facilities, and and they do production scale facilities but you think about the scramble for vaccines for COVID and, and what went on. And you think, you know, uh, you, you, it certainly uh, would have been worse to have gotten out, at least they caught it, but but you have to forgive them a little bit for stretching to try and make something happen. Um, but but all the, the COVID things aside, to me, the real, the real solid piece in there, no matter what happens, is that they own uh, the Narcan, um, mm -hmm product right so so as much as you hear and still hear even though people aren't mingling so much the problem with with uh, opioid addiction and the problem with first re first responders um, having adverse reactions to merely touching some of the very potent uh, things they encounter and that, right. that saves lives and that's that's just absolutely critical that's that's a huge it, it, it's odd to call it when you're talking about people's lives but it's a huge franchise right it is it is it is an essential piece in every 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 place in the country and in a lot of places around the world yeah definitely not a single product company and and the challenges and let, let's be honest they made some pretty pretty tragic mistakes and uh and they ultimately owned up to them and fixed them but uh the media treated them very badly and uh, I think I made the point during this presentation on this particular day that they the headline read they lo that they had lost a hundred fifty million dollar contract or something like that. Uh, but the truth behind it was they were basically shutting that one down so that they could open up an even bigger one, an even bigger. Yeah, they were they were the last one in that program, and it was coming to an end anyway. Yeah, and they, you know that's well, not what was reported. Again, it's just yeah. a reminder to trust but verify when you run into stuff like that. And, you, and as Kim was talking about earlier with the volatility, uh, it certainly produced some extreme volatility in this company. So we'll continue to hope for the best. And I'm, I'm just poking yeah. fun at the situation here. Uh, Len, your hand is up as well. Uh, why don't you uh, unmute yourself and go ahead? Okay. Uh, well, I would just add to uh, uh, what. Uh, <laughs> Matt, I'm drawing a Matt, blank. Yeah. Matt, I, I, I was confusing Matt and Mark. I was just going to add that not only uh, Narcan, they also produce uh, the anthrax vaccine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's my understanding they produce the vaccination series for government employees that are uh, traveling internationally. It's a multiple. Uh, Malaria and everything else. I may be wrong about that, but that was my understanding. Well, it's a uh, it's certainly holding us holding that list of pluses up there near the top, isn't it? It's by far the best pick so far. So, all right, thanks, Len. Merry you know Christmas. What they say about blind squirrels, Mark. You know, it's well, yeah, that that inspires. Every, we we every couple of months we learn that that those blind squirrels can go out there and do some do some good work. And so. Sometimes you bring that squirrel in with your Christmas tree. Right. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. All right, so back to the Christmas countdown. I have uh, laid out a couple of companies. Anybody out there is invited to con contribute an idea. Um, 
I'll probably claim it as my own, but no, no, I won't. I will definitely share where it came from. A couple companies we've covered so far, Steel Dynamics and Ollie's. Once again, Ollie just keeps calling out to me. Um, they've got room for expansion and places to go. But this is a company, Ken, I think you probably remember during one of our field trips to Cincinnati, uh, the locals talking about this company up in Fort Wayne. Uh, right across the street from Vera Bradley is this company, Steel Dynamics. And uh, kind of a, a new core like company that it hasn't been around very long, but man, do they seem to be executing on uh, what can be from time to time a fairly economically challenging business. But uh, the visual analysis looks pretty strong. They're into some key areas, some really decent numbers with a 20% re projected return and a uh, excellent quality ranking, um, pretty decent balance sheet situation, a little bit oversold, but a nice field of opportunity here uh, from my perspective. Uh, do you have any awareness of this company? Is it in any of your clubs, Ken? It's not in any of my clubs, but I do I have it on a few of my lists, Mark. Uh, uh, we've, we've looked at this one before. Uh, we especially were looking at it uh, – when we were seriously looking at a, uh, boy, the name's going, no, it's not, uh, Schwitzer, Schweitzer Steel out in uh, the far west, a specialty steel company. Probably Schnitzer. Uh, yeah. Schnitzer, Schnitzer, that was it, yeah. Uh, but we were, we were studying that, and we actually bought some of that, and uh, Steel Dynamics was part of that study. I remember that uh, specifically. Yeah, and it's definitely an infra infrastructure-related play also. And that's not over yet. I think uh, we're still figuring out the difference between discretionary and necessary um, spending when it comes to infrastructure. And I, th I think that is still sorting out. So uh, pretty well positioned, pretty good study. And so that's on my list for could could do fairly well over the next year or so. And here's Ollie's. Uh, Ollie's is a lot of fun. For those of you that haven't been to one yet, I would recommend going. It's a, it's like a treasure hunt. Uh, some of the stuff is deeply discounted in there. You have name brand stuff that uh, could be last year's model or overstock situations. Um, but it, we had definitely had a lot of fun. We've made one visit. We'll probably go back. I had to, as I told the audience last week, had to extricate my wife from the children's books for the grandsons. And uh, again, very favorable looking visual analysis. Nice trend, 12% growth. Uh, not overly ambitious on the profit side, uh, feasible, achievable targets, you know, somewhere in that 20% return range with uh, some verification or validation on the projected return. And uh, it's just been beat up for whatever reason, uh, probably supply chain paranoia. Um, we had a report last night uh, at our uh, model club uh, about Ollie's, and that's exactly the point that was made and made and made again, that they were having severe supply chain problems. Remember, they don't buy through normal supply chains. They buy uh, through companies that have, have uh, overrun different things or through companies that have lost their business, and, and they go in and pick up inventory, that kind of thing. Uh, they don't buy too many goods that are originally made for Ollie's in the first place. So uh, Aramita tells us that the Motley Fool newsletter is saying that Ollie's is a sell right now. Do you know anything about that, Mark? I do not, but I'll take a look. Okay. All right. So that's number two. And then the one that I'm considering adding to the Christmas countdown probably will decide sometime today. This is National Energy Services, ticker is NESR. And uh, it's, it's, I would characterize it as a miniature uh, Schlumberger slash Halliburton would be kind of the way to think of it. And both of those companies, particularly Schlumberger, have caused uh, quite a bit of impatience and consternation. Is that a good way to put it, Ken, in, in our community? We keep expecting better things from Schlumberger and... Uh, it's obviously a pretty phenomenal company over the long term, but boy, the returns have been uh, pretty lackluster for a while. And uh, uh, I, I think it fares that it's fair to say that there is a little bit of consternation here. Anyhow, this is this is a company that focuses in on uh, North Africa 
and the Middle East. And uh, uh, it, it's headquartered in the British Virgin, Virgin Isles. It does have operations in Houston, but they are, it, it, the way I characterize this situation is, again, it's oversold in the first place. That's what brings it to our attention. The fact that uh, the upside, we're basically trading near 52-week lows. Uh, the 52-week low is 856. The current price is 880. And uh, the way I would encapsulate the story is, as I understand it, and I've only done a cursory look at the company, is obviously it's a pretty good picture considering the challenges of the market that they are in, oil and gas field services. But the, the bigger picture, you know, the way I step back from it, I go back to Len Douglas's contribution on plastics and the fact that this is not all about just the gasoline that goes into cars. There's other stuff that is impacted by um, petroleum production and generation. And uh, that chart on the upper right is basically just a picture. The dark line is global oil demand. The gray line is the supply. And you can see how the supply has definitely lagged. And uh, it's, it's pretty well under. Notice this difference right here. The projections from many of the experts in the area is that there is gonna be a, a lot of needed global production of uh, petroleum products, um, again, on a global basis. And the, the way I would kind of sugarcoat it is I think their attitude is if Americans are going to be kind of illogical about this, they'll definitely take advantage. And uh, I'm, you know, I think sometimes we do tend to be a little bit illogical when it comes to some of the green stuff. I'm a great believer in green energy, but it has to be a measured approach over the long term. And it, it's not something that can be dealt with suddenly. And I think that's kind of the message. And these guys are, are willing to take advantage, plus they are leveraged over in these countries. So this, com this company has appeared a number of times in discussions. We've ne it's never gone very far in some of our best small company discussions. But uh, the deeper discount on, on the current price makes it a little bit attractive and compelling and maybe something to keep a little bit closer look at. And again, uh, using Hugh McManus's name in vain, he made a presentation on BP, uh, I want to say 18 months ago now. Oh, quite a ways, quite a longer than that, Mark. It was when BP spilled into the Gulf. Well, he's done it, he's done it twice. He did it, he, did, he actually bought shares when they started leaking oil in the Gulf. And then he, this goes back 18 months, maybe two years ago, where he, he basically talked about, uh, uh, BP is not going to disappear from the planet. They will reinvent themselves as required, et cetera. In that, uh, and it tied right in with Len Douglas's dissertation on it's not just about gasoline in your in your fuel tank. It's a much bigger question than that. And uh, some of the energy estimates and all that kind of stuff really plays into this whole situation. So we'll see how it goes. Any other thoughts on this one, Ken? Uh, not on this particular one, no, Mark. Okay. So let's go ahead and close down. Uh, just a reminder that we do archive all of these presentations, the bull sessions. We also include the monthly roundtable webcast. You can see the most recent one from November right there. Again, the December one is going to be during the first week of uh, January. Here are those panel sessions we, we talked about briefly here today, back from that conference back in November. So you can actually go back and listen to, uh, for instance, my selection of emergent biosolutions <laughs> and the rationale behind it because as long as it stays up there near the top of the chart it's probably not the last I, time I know it's not the last time we're going to hear that is it <laughs> but I also want to point out that this session here with with Cy was a hoot uh 20 questions I think we got in 12 in the allotted time but it was it was some fun so hey, it was a good session a very good session so you can go to YouTube, just search for Manifest Investing, subscribe if you want to be reminded when we add new content, and uh, you like that. Quick reminder that the December roundtable will actually take place in January, a couple days after the new year, because Ken and I are going to be running around the countryside and just basically taking the week off for Christmas. All right. Also want to wish everybody a happy solstice day. There will be more daylight tomorrow. Than today. Gotta like that. 
And then there'll be more the day, the day after tomorrow. Daylight, the day after tomorrow. It's just, In other words, it's just tonight will be the longest night of the year, right, Mark? <laughs> Finding that gray lining. All right. Here we go. Uh, Len wants to know, will there be another round table at the end of January? And the answer is yes, Len. Uh, the, the round table on January 4th will be the December uh, program, and then we'll also run one in January. All right, and here's kind of a Christmas card. Um, Ken and I have received a number of these here recently, and uh, I can't tell you how much it warms our hearts. Um, we do want to wish everybody out there a joyous and festive holiday and safe holiday season. And uh, this is just a comment from one of the subscribers, one of the attendees. This person's probably here right now. Um, you're welcome. We we appreciate the thoughts and. Uh, we enjoy doing this. We we hope it makes a difference for all of you as uh, successful long-term investors. Your thoughts, Ken? Well, uh, I've said it all uh, in this session already. Just thank you all for attending. Uh, we appreciate it. And uh, we hope to see all of you again at, at our programs in the new year. We'll keep doing them if you keep coming. All right. And with that, I'll go ahead and shut down the recording. Merry Christmas, everybody.